Hey guys, how's it going? I'm just hanging out in my greenhouse right now. My bunny is not wanting to cooperate very much. It's Asperilla. The reason there's a uh, sleeping bag behind me is uh, we keep sleeping bags over their cages during the, the winter just to keep them a little bit warmer and um, it just makes it a little bit more comfortable for them. So um, anyways, I thought I would just do a little video today. I'm going to be heading to Ontario to speak at a symposium and as a result of that I ended up uh, putting a presentation together and I had some really interesting insights that I wanted to share with you guys um, Which I think you're gonna find super interesting as well. So stay tuned to the video and uh, let me know what you think at the very end Okay, talk soon. I wanted to make a video today about this new presentation that I just created which I'll eventually share with YouTube for a symposium that I'm speaking at next week in Toronto, Ontario, Canada um, on January 19th and I think there's still tickets available for it so I'll put a link to the symposium in the show notes below and I think they're like 25 bucks so it's super cheap. Um, anyways, I got invited out there by a friend of mine, Jeff Christau, who wanted to basically create a space for professional uh, professionals in the design field, architects, engineers, um, drafts people, people that are making design decisions to get together and have a conversation about ecological design. And so my topic specifically about integrated design and how permaculture plays a role in all of the aspects of human habitat. And so as a result of building the presentation for this show, I had a really big insight, uh, kind of scary insight actually. Um, and so uh, I wanted to make a video about that and uh, I think you'll find it kind of interesting. So the thrust for permaculture, if you don't already know, is basically to create human habitat. So the places we live, greenhouses, houses, gardens, everything humans need to basically coexist on the planet or exist on the planet while coexisting. So how do we create human ecosystems, ecosystems that serve us, that also serve all the creatures, plants, animals around us? And um, in, in other words, we're not in inherently destructive. We're actually um, capable of being just as positive as we are negative, but um, the thing that we're lacking is design. We don't actually lack the knowledge. We don't lack the know-how. Um, we just have to go do it. We have to take action. And so that's why this symposium is really cool. And so Chris asked me to speak about how the greenhouse and the house and the garden and the rainwater harvesting system and the gray water system um, and all of the other different systems that you would typically find in human habitat are connected to each other. And I said, yeah, totally, I'd love to do that. And so I started thinking about the presentation and you know how to create a case for integrated design because while I'm probably going to be preaching to the choir at this symposium, um, sometimes it's good to empower the choir with information so that they can go and sing louder, basically. And so I created this... Um, pie chart which I'll bring up in the video right now and it kind of details out all the different areas that um, uh, embody the human footprint the urban human human footprint so I looked at wastewater stormwater um, food house heating um, house electricity and all of the different kind of components. I, I think I even missed a whole bunch of stuff out. Like I didn't put transportation in there. I didn't put a bunch of other energy sources. Um, and so when I was going through that, I started kind of calculating out how much energy each of these categories takes. And I wanted to create a common unit uh, that would allow people to kind of compare things and wrap their head around it. And uh, I'll actually create more granularity on that unit a little bit later when I give this presentation to YouTube. But um, uh, because I'm going to be speaking to people who understand energy, I used, I used the unit gigajoules. And so what shocked me was that when I looked at domestic hot water and space heating and household electricity and, um, and food, I was shocked at how much energy it takes relative to space heating and electricity to feed a human in the Western world. It's 55 gigajoules compared to the 18 gigajoules that is in, I believe it was in space heating annually. So 
Where does that number come from? Um, well, that number comes from the fact that, according to Wikipedia, you know, the average North American eats 3,600 calories a day. Every one of those calories, according to Harper's Magazine in an article called The Oil We Eat, and I did a video on that, which you can look here, I'll link to it up above. Um, I, I narrated that article, so if you want to listen to it, it's really good. I highly recommend it. Um, in Harper's Magazine, they talked about all the different ways that food consumes energy or requires energy in order to be, to be produced. And so it turns out that it's between 10 and 20 calories in for every calorie out. And keep in mind that a food calorie is actually a kilocalorie. So if you take 3,600 kilocalories per day times 365 days, and then you convert that over to gigajoules, it turns out that the average human needs about 55 gigajoules of energy just to keep it alive um, on an annual basis. Um, and so there's a lot of emphasis in design around the Living Building Challenge and Passive House and all of these different building systems to reduce household energy, electricity, and thermal energy, which is super important. But our houses are incredible spaces, especially the houses when we combine them with the property around them, because they can be used to harvest rainwater, they can be used to grow our food, at least a portion of our food, they can be used, um, and especially the landscapes can be used to treat grey water, they can be used to process composting toilet waste, I know that might sound gross and surprising to you, but it's totally doable. And uh, the only thing that's preventing us from getting from where we are right now, here to there, is a little bit of knowledge, um, general awareness from the public and a desire to do it, and, and then taking action. I mean, there are a bunch of laws and rules that are preventing it right now, but it doesn't have to be that way. So I thought I would share that because, you know, as a mechanical engineer, I get asked a lot about housing. Sometimes it's easy to kind of forget about food, thinking that, you know, food's not really a big liability or a big issue. Um, but when you look at the amount of energy that our food system currently requires um, to eat conventional food, the minute you start withdrawing natural gas or fossil fuels or any of the energy sources that it requires, um, you've got famine, you've got starvation on your hands. It's a serious issue. Um, and the good news is, is that we can actually produce all of this food. We don't need to have all these fossil fuel inputs. Even if we cut the fossil fuel inputs down to a fact by a factor of five or a factor of 10, you know, that'd be a huge improvement and we could continue to improve it beyond that. I think my buddy Curtis Stone, who I'm interviewing next week, by the way, on Wednesday, if you're interested in having a conversation with Curtis, we're going to be talking about his book um, Wednesday on the Verge Permaculture channel at 3.30 p.m. Um, on Ideas on the Verge. We're going to be doing a live stream together. Um, he grow, grew over 20,000 pounds of food on five less than five gallons of gasoline um, a few years ago. And so we can grow enormous amounts of calories with very small amounts of fossil fuels using things like walk behind tractors and walk behind cedars and all of that stuff. Um, but it's all about getting the design right, getting the scale, time, placement, and form of these systems correct. So I just wanted to read you, because it's really short, um, what we're going to be doing at the Design Symposium. And if you're interested in joining, I'll make sure I put a link to the symposium down below. And uh, if you have any questions, get in touch with me or get in touch with Chris. So over, overview. The Eco Design Symposium will bring together designers, architects, landscape architects, engineers, and students around the theme of ecological design within the context of the unfolding eco-crisis. An eco-crisis is defined as the collapse of ecosystems and biodiversity due to, to the change, changes in the environment. The plight of, of coral, birds, bees, humans, forests, aquifers, and more all bear witness to an unfolding global eco-crisis. Each action we take as designers, engineers, architects is amplified by a thousand, a million times when our designs are realized as buildings, roads, earthworks, sewers, products, and more. We have a unique opportunity to positively and directly intervene in the eco-crisis. We can deploy ideas that promote ecosystems and encourage biodiversity. The goals of the symposium are to foster conversations about designers' roles in the eco-crisis, share examples of ecological design in action, facilitate networking amongst like-minded people, um, and this symposium is organized as part of the Design TO Festival happening from January 18th to the 27th. 
Design TO takes design out of the studio and into the city, transforming the urban space into a celebration for all things design. So I think it's gonna be really great guys. And if you are in that area, I'd love to connect with you. So check out the link below and uh, get your tickets if you're interested in showing up. Um, and then one last little announcement, I'm gonna be in Peterborough on Sunday teaching an introduction to permaculture class, which takes the whole day. And uh, it's essentially the front end of a permaculture design course. So if you've never taken that and you're interested in learning about permaculture and you live near Peterborough, you might be interested in checking that out. I'll put a link to the Endeavor Center's website below as well. And uh, you can find out more information about that course. Okay, guys, hopefully you have a fantastic weekend. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody out in Ontario next week. And we'll see you guys real soon. Oh,